The following video is a recording of a lecture from Genes to Galaxies, the 35th Professor Harry Messel International Science School, presented to high achieving Year 11 and 12 students from across Australia and 10 other countries. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the second of our two talks from NASA. This morning we are here to share with you something really, really exciting. You all have been seeing in the news all the excitement surrounding the 40th anniversary of the first landing on the moon. You all are poised to be in the driver's seat for front hand, front hand view of NASA's return to the moon. We have an exciting program where we are going to send astronauts back to the moon by the year 2020. We're going to do a lot of exciting things on the moon, and we're here to share some of those, some of that excitement with you. So to start, uh, we're going to show a short video clip of what this is all about. If I can find it. It was just here. Why is it? Here we go. Final launch ready and sold. The end. And it's out. DLC. DLC go. DC face. DC go. DC. DC go. FTS. FTS go. Or TN. Or TN go. GNC. DC go.
All right. Let's pull up the uh, presentation again. When I watch that, it just makes me want to think, I hope 2020 comes tomorrow. It is just, every, every time I watch that video, I, it just, I just get goosebumps. It, it is an awesome video, and it just shows you the excitement that is, surrounds the whole program. In fact, so good, you know, it almost looks like it's done. Uh, so anyway, so let, let's talk a little bit about what we saw here in terms of what does it take to actually get back to the moon. Those of you who are familiar with the Apollo program and how the Apollo program work might recognize or s recognize some of the elements that you saw there. They look very familiar. They look very familiar to what you saw during the Apollo program days. And there's a reason for that. What happened during the Apollo program was the scientists and engineers figuring out how to get to the moon had a very difficult problem. They were challenged in terms of that the stuff it takes to get to the moon weighs a lot. And it had to fit on top of a single rocket and it had to do all the things required to get to the moon. We have to blast off from the Earth. We have to survive a three-day trip to the moon. They had to land on the moon. They had to bring the astronauts back safely. And there was a certain way to do it, and that certain way was dominated by the laws of physics. Well, guess what? The laws of physics haven't changed in the last 40 years. The last we checked, probably haven't changed in the last 400 years or ever. But the reason that the sequence of events that you see today of what we're proposing look very similar to what happened in 1960, it's because the Apollo engineers got it right. A lot of times we go back when, we, when we're trying to figure out how to design things or how, to, how the mission is going to unfold, a lot of times we ask ourselves, how did the Apollo people did it, do it? And there's a temptation amongst the engineers of my design team to go off and say, all right, well, that's how Apollo did it, and so that's, we'll do something similar. We have given our engineers a challenge, and we tell them, you can't just do something just because that's the way it was done in Apollo. Every time they look at something done in, they look at something that was done in Apollo, we tell them, you have to understand why it was done that way and convince yourselves that that is the right way for us. And guess what? 99 out of 100 times when they figure out why did Apollo do it a certain way, 99 out of 100 times the Apollo people were right. And that's because for two reasons. Number one, in the 1960s, they were very, very smart people. And number two, the laws of physics do not change. And what you see here is optimal for the laws of physics in terms of the way that we'd like to conduct this mission. So we are building two new launch vehicles. This is one thing that's different from Apollo. When we went to the moon in the 1960s, everything fit on top of the gigantic Saturn V rocket. Both the Apollo uh, command and service modules that took the astronauts all the way to the moon and the lunar module Eagle that landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon. When this time around, we're actually going to use two rockets. The first rocket here is called the Ares-1. We nickname it the stick because it is so skinny that if you look at it on the launch pad, it looks like it's going to snap in half. It is, that, it is that skinny of a rocket. In fact, I think the Ares-1, we're planning to do a launch test of this sometime within the next year or so. It was supposed to happen already, but these things are very hard to build. There are a lot of technical difficulties, and the testing is a little bit behind schedule. But within a year, you all are going to see this thing fly, just like you saw in the first minute of the video. The Ares-1 is composed of a first stage here, and those of you familiar with the space shuttle program will say, hey, that looks really familiar. These are almost exactly the same solid rocket boosters that we use to lift the space shuttle off the ground today. They're not going to be exactly the same, but they're going to be derived from space shuttle parts. It's what we call a heritage design. So th this is a solid rocket, much like we use on the space shuttle today. The second stage of the Ares-1 is a liquid-fueled rocket, and it contains, it is powered by what we call a J-2 engine. And those of you that know your Apollo history will know the J-2 engine was one of the rockets that we used to power the upper stages of Saturn V. Now, even though we call it this J-2 engine, it's actually a, a very, it's a new engine today. It was based on the old design, but those designs are old and I, I won't necessarily say out of date, but it's very, very difficult to pull something off the shelf from the 1960s with blueprints and just build it again. It just, it, it doesn't work that way. So a lot of it had to be redesigned from scratch. And on top, 
the, at the very tip of the Ares-1 rocket, this is the Orion spacecraft. This is the new, NASA's newest spacecraft that's being built to carry astronauts into space. The astronaut it is composed of two parts. There's a service module that you see down here, and there's a command module. And what just happened? Did you, oh, thanks. <laughs> You're talking too slow. Yes, I'm talking, <laughs> it's the computer's way of saying move along, all right. <laughs> And so they, they ride in the space on top of the Ares-1. The big beast that you see up here, this is the mother of all rockets. This is, would have been Warner Von Braun's dream to build something like this. This is going to be bigger than the Saturn V. If, uh, I, and let me tell you how crazy this is. At the Johnson Space Center in Texas, we have a Saturn V rocket that was supposed to be used for one of the final three Apollo missions that was canceled. We flew all the way up to Apollo 17, and then there was 18, 19, and 20. The Saturn Vs were all built for them, and then the program got canceled, and they became museum pieces. We have one of those down at the Johnson Space Center in Texas, and they have laid all three stages end to end in this gigantic building. And laid end to end, that Saturn V is longer than a football field. And you just walk around under that gigantic rocket, the diameter of that first stage is 10 meters. And it is just all inspiring just walking around under that, realizing how big of a rocket that is, and thinking that somebody had the guts to fly something like that 40 years ago. This is going to be bigger. This will be 117 meters when stood fully upright, so that's something like uh, 384 feet. So it'll be 20 feet higher than the Saturn V. It will generate more thrust than the Saturn V. And it is all because we have to launch a lunar lander on top of it called the Altair into space, and that lunar lander weighs 45 thousand kilograms, so 45 metric tons. That is big for a spacecraft. Uh, could you get the next slide, please? Thanks. So I wanted to put for you the height of the Ares 5 in perspective. I have superimposed the artist rendition of the Ares 5 uh, against the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And ignore the opera house here because the, the perspective is wrong. The opera house isn't that tall. So the, uh, you, you, you all know the opera house is not as tall as the Sydney Harbor Bridge. So, but it, the, the top of the Sydney Harbor Bridge is 134 meters at the top. The Aries 1, the tip, is 117 meters. So think Sydney Harbor Bridge when you think about the height of the Aries 5. And let me tell you, on Sunday, I, uh, Arissa and I had the opportunity to climb the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And at the top, I remember looking down at the water uh, nearly 134 meters below us, thinking, boy, that's a long way down. And then I thought to myself, that's going to be the height of our rocket. And it was, it was, uh, it was just a, a scary thought. So number one, uh, for those of you who are not from Australia in town, recommend that you climb the Harbor Bridge before you go home. Unique experience. But when you, uh, when you get to the top, look all the way down, look at the water, and think the rocket that we're going to use to send astronauts back to the moon is that tall. And the reason it is that tall is it takes a lot of energy to get all our heavy equipment all the way up to the moon. During the Apollo days in the 1960s, they stacked everything they needed on top of the Saturn V rocket. The reason that we need two rockets to get our stuff into space is because in 40 years, you've heard, you've heard the theory here that Americans have gotten fatter. And that, it, no, that's not, okay. Uh, now, the, the, re the reason here is that we're trying to do more than we did in Apollo. During, in, the, during the Apollo days, we, we were able to take two astronauts to the surface of the moon. If you remember the third, poor old Michael Collins had to stay in the command module, wishing he could go down with Neil and Buzz. When we go back to the moon, we'll be taking four astronauts to the moon, and all four will be going down to the moon, and we'll be staying for longer periods of time. We will be doing more scientific exploration. We will be doing more fascinating things, which Arissa will talk to you about. That all takes more mass to accomplish, and that's why we just can't fit it on top of one rocket. And if we were to fit it on top of one rocket, that rocket would be over 600 feet tall. It would almost be impractical to fly. So that, that's why we're doing two. Next slide, please. This is uh, what we call an exploded version uh, picture. That's probably, you know what, that, that's not, not, not really a good term to use when it comes to vehicles. But this is what we call an exploded diagram. I've never really liked that term of the Orion spacecraft. This is the crew module. This is where the astronauts live and work for their journey into space. This is a service module. The service module contains the fuel tanks for the Orion. It contains solar arrays to power the vehicle. It contains a lot of the vehicle's electronics. So a lot of the things that are not directly related with life support functions are in the service module. 
and the astronauts ride into space in the crew module up here. It is a tight, tight fit. For those of you who, how many of you here would like to go to the moon someday? Awesome. Well, that, on one hand, that's awesome. On the other hand, keep <laughs> listening to us talk, and how dangerous this is will cure you of that thought really quick. <laughs> but, which actually, you know what? I, 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 shouldn't, I, I, sh I shouldn't digress like this, but I have a, I have a really funny anecdote. It is, when, when we're building these things, at the beginning, there's a lot of challenges, and you never think the vehicle's going to work because you have to overcome these challenges, and there's a lot of dangers and risks that you have to drive down before these vehicles are considered safe enough for the crew to fly in. So there was one day at work, I have a young engineer who worked on our team. His name will, uh, will go nameless because I have great respect for him. And in his defense, I was asking him a trick question, and he didn't realize this. We were talking about the landing system of the vehicle, which at that time, the landing system was horrible. Uh, you, you just wind up getting crushed if, you, if, you, if the vehicle would ever be built like that. So I asked him, would you ever like to go to the moon someday in this capsule? And would you like to be an astronaut? And he said, oh yeah, I'd, I'd really love to ride in this. And immediately I said, all right, you failed the question. And the reason for that was that if you were listening to what we've been working on, this capsule is so dangerous right now, no one should ever set foot in this. So that's when he realized I was asking him a trick question. But at the beginning, when you design these things, there are immense challenges. And one of the keys here is to drive the risk to an acceptable level low enough that you actually would ride in it. Because there are people that set foot in these capsules, they rocket into outer space, and they put their lives on the line. But guess what? They've got, they've got husbands and wives, they've got kids, and if you are the designer, you don't want to be the one knocking on somebody's door telling them why daddy's not coming home tonight. And so that's, that's the mantra that we tell our people, is that if, it, if you wouldn't ride in this, don't think that you should subject someone else to ride in it. And, and that's something that our people have to think about every day, is that when we're at school, I mean, an example here is when, you at when we're at school and we take a test and we get 90 out of 100, we're feeling pretty good, all right? We only miss 10 of them. We make mistakes here, people die. And so it is a very, very tough responsibility. Next slide, please. The Orion vehicle we hope to have flying by the year 2014. And one of its initial jobs before taking astronauts to the moon will be sending astronauts to the International Space Station. Why is that? Well, we only have eight space shuttle flights left, or maybe nine. I have not looked at the manifest. The space shuttle has been flying since April of 1981. When John Young and Bob Crippen rode in space on Space Shuttle Columbia. So it's very, very old technology. There are a lot of people within NASA who believe that it is risky technology right now because it is an old system. As you know, we have lost 14 lives flying the space shuttle. So we are going to retire the space shuttle, and we will be replacing it with the Orion in terms of taking astronauts to the space station. Orion should be able to take four to six astronauts to the International Space Station by the year 2014 or 2015. That will leave the United States with a four or five year gap in which we will not have a way of sending humans into space. During this time though, the Russians are going to come to our rescue. They have a very capable system, the Soyuz. And in that time, all the international partners who have spent a lot of money and time creating a wonderful space station to do scientific experiments will rely on the Russians for rides into space. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's a little bit about the pieces. Let's talk a little bit about the vehicles that are going to get us to the moon and back. This is the Ares-1 rocket, and the first thing that will happen is the astronauts will ride into space in the Orion capsule on top of the Ares-1 rocket. This is, the, this is the first out of two launches in the system. This will occur from either pad 39A or 39B in Florida. And th this is, this is I, I get sentimental about these things, and this is what's really cool. 39A and 39B have an immense proud history in space culture. Those were the launch pads from which all the Apollo astronauts left for the moon. Those are the la same launch pads that all the space shuttle astronauts departed from. They will be the same launch pads that we will send astronauts back to the moon by the year 2020. So 39A and 39B kind of have a special place uh, in, in, in the hearts of people that work at NASA. But I tell you, those, are those, those launch pads are, re are really beat up after 40 years of use. Uh, rocket exhaust really beats the crap out of, out of the cement there. And, and, and I remember being, I, I was uh, on, the on the launch tower 
not the other day, it was maybe a year ago, uh, trying to figure out how they loaded certain, uh, certain, uh, certain chemicals into the space shuttle. We were, we were there to do some research, and we were about maybe 35 meters off the ground, and I remember putting my hand on the guardrail to rest, and it was all rusty, and the thing snapped off and almost fell off, and uh, I caught my balance, otherwise I would have tumbled down 30 meters uh, to a untimely demise, but uh, anyway, that just shows you th those launch pads are really beat up, but we're going to refurbish them, they're going to look new, and we will use those to bring astronauts to the moon. Now, there's two launches, and a lot of people, there's a big debate as to whether we launched the Orion first or we launched the, Al the Altair on top of the Ares 5 first. Altair is the lunar lander. We are choosing to launch the, right now, we are choosing to launch the Orion first for one primary reason. There's actually two, two major reasons, but the biggest one here is that we hope to launch these things 90 minutes apart. And so we want to get the astronauts off the launch pad and into space before the big monster Ares 5 lifts off. We would, just for safety reasons, it would probably not be as safe to have the astronauts sitting in the Ares 1 on the launch pad while we launch the Ares 5 in the unlikely event that something bizarre were to happen. Uh, you've seen all those movies from the 1960s of rockets blowing up on the launch pad. That never happens anymore, but we don't want to take risks. So that the Ares 1 will likely go first. But it's, it's a debate. Every three or four months, we change the launch order, and then it changes back. And uh, hopefully, in five or 10 years, we'll have it figured out. Next slide, please. So after the astronauts uh, blast off into space on the Ares 1, then we will light off the Ares 5 launch vehicle carrying the Altair lunar lander inside the nose cone. This is a big, big rocket. We hope to launch this 90 minutes after the, after the astronauts jet into space on the Orion. But those of you who have ever tried to watch a launch in Florida know that weather delays happen. We have hydrogen leaks. We have people sailing their sailboats behind the launch pad. No, that, that actually happens. We, we actually have to delay launches because people sail their sailboats behind the launch pad and it would look bad to shoot them out with the Coast Guard. So we actually have to go out there and escort them. This is not communist country or anything like that. We, we, uh, they're, they're, they're nice to them. They get arrested, but they don't, they don't get shot or anything like that. Um, <laughs> So it could, be, it could be that the Ares 1 won't get off, the, sorry, the Ares 5 won't get off the launch pad 90 minutes after the Ares 1. The Orion capsule has the ability to what we call loiter or hang out in low Earth orbit for three or four days waiting for the Ares 5 to launch. So if we don't get the Ares 5 off 90 minutes after the Ares 1, we have a three or four day margin or pad in the schedule before things become dicey and we have to start deciding whether to bring the astronauts home or not. Next slide, please. The job of the Ares 5 is to launch the Altair into low lunar orbit, not low lunar orbit, low Earth orbit, sorry about that. And this is, a, uh, this is an artist rendition of what it would look like once it gets into low lunar orbit. You can see here, here is the Altair not low lunar orbit, sorry about that. that's low Earth orbit. You can see the Earth in the background. Last I checked, the moon does not have continents and oceans and clouds. That's probably a true statement. Okay, should probably check my facts, but I think it's pretty correct. So there is the, there is the Altair spacecraft, and what you see back down here is the upper stage of the Ares 5. Can we go back yep. to the uh, exploded launch vehicle diagram? So if you see here, the Ares 5 is composed of several segments. There is the core first stage. It's assisted by two solid rockets. And then this is the upper stage. And in that last artist rendition, you saw the Altair lunar lander on top of the upper stage. We call it the EDS. It stands for Earth Departure Stage. It has two jobs. This, this one will boost the entire launch vehicle and the, and the lunar lander most of the way through the Earth's atmosphere. Then the second stage, the Earth departure stage, will light up. Its job is to then finish the boost into low Earth orbit. But if we go back to that other slide, please, the LEO slide, it stays with the Altair because the Earth departure stage also has a job of pushing everything onward to the moon in a big burn that we call TLI. It stands for translunar injection. Next slide, please. Once the, this is the EDS, once the Earth departure stage, once the Earth departure stage and the Altair reach low Earth orbit, then the Orion must come seek it out. 
So this is an act that we call rendezvous and docking. It's something that we have practiced since the 1960s and something that NASA has gotten very, very good at. There was a time when in the race to the moon in the 1960s where it was recognized that rendezvous and docking was going to be an important skill, but it was unclear how to do that. It's a very, very difficult thing to pull off, even though NASA makes it look easy now. Imagine two cars going down the freeway very, very fast. I, 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 we, we work in an English unit country, and so we mix units, so I apologize for this, but it's 17,000 miles per hour in low Earth orbit, extremely fast, and two vehicles have to meet up with exactly the same speed so that they, they can dock with each other. So it's, it's really a tough problem, but the Orion's job then is to seek out the Altair and the top half of the Ares 5 in low Earth orbit and dock. So you can see the final sequence, the final stages of the docking maneuver here. We dock the vehicles head to head. So in other words, the, Al the, the Orion nose cone is there, the top of the Altair is there, and they dock in low Earth orbit, and it's what we call hard mate, so they're physically connected to each other. Then the next step, once that docking occurs, this J2 engine will light up again, and the Earth departure stage will push this entire stack all the way to the moon. Next slide, please. It actually doesn't push it all the way to the moon, per se. It provides the energy for the, for the Altair and the Orion to reach the moon. But once after the burn is complete, we get rid of the upper stage, the EDS, and the, the docked pair between Altair and the Orion fly to the moon, dock to each other, very much the same way as they did during the Apollo era missions. Going to the moon, the moon is, how far is the moon? 384,000 some odd kilometers away. It is, it is a distance that takes about three days to cover even moving at these fast speeds when, when they leave the Earth. During those three days, the astronauts primarily live inside the Orion capsule, but they spend the time getting ready to actually get to the moon and, and making sure that the Altair lunar lander is ready to do its job. One of the things in the Altair lunar lander you will see is this not, it doesn't look so clear here, but down here, there, there is a main engine here, that main engine burns a fuel of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. This vehicle is extremely big because it has 25,000 kilograms, 25 metric tons of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen fuel. One of, the, one of the biggest burns that this engine will do is when we get to the moon three days after leaving the Earth, this engine has to light up to do a burn that we call LOI. It stands for lunar orbit insertion. If we don't do this burn, it's, it's a slow down burn. If we do not do the slow down burn, this entire stack will fly away from the moon and will not come back. So that burn is very, very critical to slow down to allow the gravity of the moon to capture the vehicles into an orbit about 100 kilometers off the surface. Next slide, please. Once we actually, once we actually get into the vicinity of, of the landing site, this is after we get into orbit around the moon, you know what, I, I don't have the right picture here, but these, these two vehicles are still docked together as we do the lunar orbit insertion burn, and they're still docked together as we orbit the moon waiting for the landing site to, to come under us and we get in a position to execute landing. Bef before that happens though, all four astronauts living inside the Orion spacecraft will crawl through a tunnel. It's, it's, a, it's a physical tunnel so they don't have to do a spacewalk to get between the two vehicles, and they will crawl through the tunnel and transfer from the Orion into this part of the Altair lunar lander, which is their cockpit, which is the cockpit for the, for the lander, and that's where they'll fly the lander all the way to the surface. Now, in the, remember when we said in the Apollo days that there were three astronauts, there was a commander, a command module pilot, and a lunar module pilot, the commander and the lunar module pilot, in the case of Apollo 11, that was Armstrong and Aldrin, they went down to the moon and Michael Collins stayed in orbit around the Earth, or around the moon. When we fly to the moon with the, with, with the Constellation program, all four astronauts are going to climb into Altair for the trip down to the surface and to explore the moon. The Orion vehicle will be left on autopilot circling the moon, so as they crawl in there, one of the last things that they have to do is to verify that somebody has the keys 
to the other vehicle because they don't want to be locked out. I don't think the auto club is going to come get them. No, just kidding. Uh, the, 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 what, what, what's different between what we're doing now in the 60s is that in the 1960s, the way that they designed these vehicles was very much like they designed fighter aircraft. It, it, the, the mentality at the time was that spacecraft are like fighter airplanes. They are high performance vehicles and you need people to do everything. And in fact, we really do want human control in a lot of aspects because that split second decision when one has to make a judgment call, if the data is available, people are better at making that judgment call than computers. Since the 1960s though, we have become very, very confident in our ability to do autopilot for spacecraft. And in fact, we have over 45 years of history of sending spacecraft to other planets, to Mars, to Jupiter, to Saturn, with the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft that, uh, that Jill talked about yesterday on its way out to the cosmos with the record on the side that's going to lead the Klingons back to Earth. And anyway, um, But we are very, very capable and familiar and experienced now with designing autopilots for spacecraft. And that is one of the reasons that we now have the confidence that we can leave the Orion vehicle on autopilot while, er, while the astronauts go down the surface of the moon. And in fact, if something goes wrong with the Orion while the astronauts are on the surface of the moon, it can be controlled either from Altair or from mission control in Houston by remote control. So it's, it's not there left to its own devices. Next slide, please. The Altair vehicle will undock and then that main engine will perform a huge braking maneuver, uh, upwards of 2,000 meters per second worth of braking and it will hopefully touch down on the moon in a, in a safe area. Now, the landing sequence is very, very difficult. It takes, how, how long does the landing sequence take? Do you remember? 13 to 15 minutes. Yeah, thir 13 to 15 minutes. And it has to be executed precisely because we have a requirement that we need to land one kilometer or less, preferably within 100 meters of the designated landing site. On Apollo, many times, they were many kilometers off from where they were supposed to land because their guidance systems and their inertial navigation systems were not as good. We have a much more precise landing requirement because eventually we would like to build a lunar outpost on the surface of the moon where we can conduct scientific research. And you can envision if we aren't able to land precisely by the outpost, well, those astronauts are going to have to walk a long way. And then when they get back, they'll be knocking on our doors. Hey, you guys messed it up and we had to do this long walk. And anyway, so. Uh, we have a really precise landing requirements and actually touching down on the surface of the moon is quite dangerous because the moon has lots of rocks, it, the ground is uneven, it has hills, it has valleys, pits, craters. And we have to design instruments that can scan the surface looking for these hazards and inside the vehicle in the cockpit we're going to have 3D displays where, the, where we'll have instruments like radars and lidars. Lidars are, you can think of laser radars to image the surface of the moon and display that topography inside the cockpit so the astronauts will be able to determine where to put the vehicle down. Once they get to the surface, they, you, you see how big the astronauts are compared to the, to, to the lander there. That's actually, this is the scale. This, 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 is not a, this is not a joke here. This is a very tall vehicle at its tip. It's about nine and a half meters off the surface of the ground. So think two-story house. Think of trying to land a two-story house at a touchdown speed less than what a falling leaf coming off a tree might hit the ground. It is, it is that kind of precision that we must be able to execute, otherwise these poor fragile landing legs will crush and the vehicle will be destroyed. The, I, I have a really funny story about this ladder back here. I, 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 can't, I can't resist. Gene Cernan. Commander Gene Cernan, the last, actually he was captain by the time he retired, so my apologies to uh, Mr. Cernan, was the last astronaut to set foot on the moon on Apollo 17. One of the things that we do from time to time is that we ask our former Apollo astronauts for advice on what we're doing because they've been there. They understand what it is like to work on the moon. So we, our, our human factors people are extremely paranoid about this ladder because it's, it's, a, it's a big ladder and you've got to climb down in a big bulky spacesuit. And there's a lot of worry that people are going to just fall off the ladder because it's really big. So in, we had Gene in Houston once, and we said, hey, Gene, we're concerned about this ladder. Well, what are your thoughts on it? And his, his, he, th he looked at it, and he goes, well, let me tell you something. If you fear that the astronaut is so clumsy that he's going to fall off the ladder, 
well, the solution is don't bring him to the moon. <laughs> but it, it, it is big, and one of the challenges here, though, is actually not the astronauts climbing down because we hope that these astronauts are in top physical condition, but there will be equipment on the top deck that we actually have to get to the surface. And moving equipment off the top deck, trying to lower it down the, the equivalent of one and a half stories to the lunar surface without breaking it is a challenge. And so far, we have, we, we're trying to figure out how to do that. We're also trying to figure out ways in which we can make the thing smaller. But as we mentioned before, this thing is dominated by propellant. The laws of physics have not changed. If we want to bring all this equipment down to the moon, there's not a whole lot we can do about that problem. Next slide, please. Once the lunar mission is over, the astronauts will, can we go back one, please? If, if, I, if you remember, I described the bottom part is almost all fuel. The top part here, this is where the astronauts live and work. That is the ascent module. The cockpit is in there. After they're done, they will climb back up into the ascent module. Next slide, please. And the ascent module will use the bottom half where the fuel tanks are, that we, what we call a descent module, as a launch pad. They will lift off into low lunar orbit. They will seek out the Orion. Hopefully somebody will have brought the keys with them. And all four will climb through the tunnel back into the Orion spacecraft. Now, well, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we get rid of the ascent module because it is no longer useful. We could bring it back to Earth with us, but it's, it's, it's very hard to do that and really wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be worthwhile to try to do that. But we have to actually get rid of this in such a way that it doesn't come crashing down where we want it, namely the lunar outpost. And we've been debating how to do that for quite some time. And my solution, actually, is to intentionally target the lunar outpost with the ascent vehicle under the rationale that we couldn't hit the lunar outpost if we tried. <laughs> so the best way to avoid it is to try to hit it. Next slide. The Orion vehicle, uh, can we go back one, please? The Orion vehicle will then, they will, the astronauts will fire this engine. This is the main engine of the Orion. And it will do a burn that we call TEI for trans-Earth injection to propel this entire vehicle back towards the Earth for the journey home. Next slide, please. The journey home, much like the journey to the moon, will take about three days in which the astronauts will, desert, will get a well-deserved rest. They can Twitter people saying, hey, I'm just coming back from the moon. Okay. <laughs> And then, once we get to the vicinity of the Earth, we will jettison the service module and the command module, or actually I should say the crew module. We called it the command module in the 1960s. Now we call it the crew module, just so we could keep the acronym the same. And this will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in a scheme very much like what we showed you yesterday with the Mars, Mars Exploration rovers going through the fiery descent to the Martian atmosphere. Same technique with an ablative heat shield and we will splash down in the Pacific Ocean somewhere off the coast of California. So it'll feel like the 1960s again. We'll be splashing down the ocean rather, landing, rather than landing like an airplane on a runway. People ask, well, why are you doing this? You spent the last 25 years trying to figure out how to get spacecraft into space and land on a runway like an airplane so you can use it again. The reason for that is that the space shuttle and going to the moon have very, very different goals. With the space shuttle, we build, we've built an international space station. We've learned to work and live in space. And we wanted a reusable space plane. But if you think about going to the moon, we don't need any of that. We don't need wings. We don't need heat shields at the moon. We're not carrying large amounts of cargo to the moon. So building a winged vehicle to fly to the moon is not very practical. It can be done. But remember yesterday I was telling you the trade-off that you never have as much mass to do everything that you want to do. If you spend your time putting wings on the Apollo spacecraft or the lunar lander, that's just mass that you could have used to do something else on the moon. So in terms of if the sole purpose of what we are doing here is to send astronauts directly into space and to the moon and back, then the way that we do it on the space shuttle is not the most mass efficient to do it, which is why we're going to go going back to go and, and splashing down in the ocean. OK, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Arissa, who is going to tell you about all the cool things we're going to do on the moon. Oh, right. Here you go. Thank you. Um, 
Hello. So um, what I was planning to do was to um, realize that most of your speakers have been, um, I would say, much more distinguished than myself in terms of their, their career and the amount of things they've gotten to do. So I thought um, it would be nice to be able to join Wayne and uh, not only tell you a little bit about um, what I, um, the vehicle that we're designing to build, but also uh, what it's like to be a young engineer at NASA. So I'll try and share a little bit of that, um, as well as some um, information about the, the vehicle that we're designing. Um, so to start with that, I, I um, sort of a day in the life. Um, I've been at JPL almost three years, and I've worked on a couple of other missions and um, injury descent and landing projects that JPL does, which has been primarily our Mars missions. Um, the latest one, the Mars Science Laboratory that's getting ready to, to launch um, in two years. That was supposed to launch in September and has been delayed. I've had the opportunity to work on Altair with Wayne for almost um, a year and a half to two years of that. So it's been a really good opportunity. And you can imagine there are a lot of cool things to do in spacecraft and working at JPL, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But to get to work on the next lunar lander, something we haven't done in 40 years, we probably won't do again once we do it because we're hoping to move forward to Mars, is a really neat opportunity. So I've been very excited about that and I'm excited to share a little bit about that um, with you. Um, in terms of what I would do on a daily basis, just to give you a sense, so I, I'm a systems engineer, uh, which means that I work with all of our subsystem experts that design different pieces of the vehicle. So on the vehicle you have a life support system, you have a power system, thermal, propulsion, um, computer, all, all of your flight processors and hardware, your telecommunications system, and so there are experts that are designing each of those pieces. And there's someone that, that needs to work at an interface level above that to make sure that, that each of those individuals working those different systems, that they come together as a vehicle and, and, and complete the, the mission's requirements um, together. So that's part of what my role is, is to, to understand and work with those subsystem experts to make sure that the different pieces that they're working on and the different analyses that they're doing and design studies that they're doing aren't harmful in some way to the other uh, pieces of the vehicle when they, when they come together to work, to work as an entire spacecraft. Uh, so a lot of that is sitting in meetings. A lot of that is um, working sort of back of the envelope calculations. I don't know if you have the same terminology in <coughs> Australia. Um, to, to double check what's going on and make sure that, that uh, we haven't missed some big assumption uh, that, that what we're doing makes sense. But the other part of it, too, is that there have been a lot of opportunities, given that it's the next lunar lander, to meet some very, very interesting people, such as some of the Apollo astronauts, and also some opportunities to do some fun things. Um, so if you want to move, I think that one is next. Okay, so we'll talk about a little bit about the design process. Can you, am I loud enough? You guys can hear me. Um, is everybody awake? <laughs> so uh, this is a view of the Altair vehicle itself. Um, so these are the same view, obviously, but they're, uh, sorry, the same vehicle, but at two different views. And then this is a cutout view where we've taken off um, the outer layer of um, the MLI blankets, but they're really what um, help us do thermal control of the vehicle and protect, protect it from debris that we might find in space. So the primary pieces of the vehicle are the descent module. You've heard Wayne talk about some of this already. There's the descent module, which does most of our propulsive activity. It also has as much of the um, different systems that I just talked about on the descent module as possible because when we launch the ascent module to get the astronauts back off the surface, the fewer things that we have there, the better because it means that we, that obviously more mass is, is heavier um, and therefore requires more fuel to lift back off. So we try and minimize what that is so that we can carry less fuel. So you have the descent module, the ascent module, where the astronauts do live and work. Um, and then you have the airlock is the third piece, and the airlock is what helps them get in and out of the vehicle and onto the surface. So two things before I, I go any further into the, the design. Um, so the big, big mission requirements that we have that differentiate this, um, this new uh, architecture from Apollo, one is the number of crew members that we want to send to the surface, which you heard about. That's four. Second is the type of missions that we want to do. We want to be able to do science on the, on the lunar surface for seven days at a time, and then for the, out, the outpost mission that he mentioned where we would send astronauts to actually work at the scientific research station, we expect people to be able to stay on the moon up to 210 days. So that's kind of a long time to be away from home in a place that you can't necessarily go to the grocery store and buy food, uh, you can't you know, walk out, even, you think about even in the old days when they had to go get water out of the well or they had to go get it from the river. They, you don't have that option either. So forget plumbing um, you know, unless you brought it with you. So 210 days on the surface, which we, we hope is, is an opportunity to learn how to do those things 
and in a place that doesn't naturally support life so that we can take those technologies um, forward to Mars or to any other place that we think we might want to go for a long period of time. And then the, the third mission requirement that differentiates us is something that we call global access. So if you remember, all of the Apollo missions went to the equatorial region of the moon. And part of the reason they did that was because of the lighting that was available that made it easier for them to land, as well as um, it, it, it was sort of the easiest option. Um, if we wanted to go to the moon, that was sort of the, the, the easiest way to do a mission. So for the future missions, if we really want to go all over the moon and do scientific research, if we want to get to the South Pole and, and set up um, a research station, then we need a vehicle that can go to all those different places. And, and for those of you that, I, I'm not sure I, in high school how much, I, I know you guys have studied physics, I'm not sure how much orbital mechanics you've gotten, but there, there are laws of physics, obviously. I, I, you laugh, is that because there's no orbital mechanics? Does anybody know what orbital mechanics is? A couple of people, it's, it has to do with our solar system and the way things move around the sun and the earth and the moon, right? So the laws of physics that govern the way our universe operates. Um, so there, there are laws um, of physics that apply in orbital mechanics that basically um, dictate the way that you would land on another planet, the way that you would approach another planet and do trajectories. And so um, without going into any more detail about that, it's very difficult to build um, a single vehicle that can do all of those things without giving it a lot of capability. All those things, all of these different mission requirements are, mean that we have to add something to the vehicle that Apollo wasn't capable of doing. So those have created new challenges. Um, and, and force us to think about new ways to do things. Um, so a little bit about, let's see, that's the mission requirements um, and where we want to go. There was a third thing I wanted to talk, I'm trying to remember. That's okay, I'll think about it. Um, so in terms of a little bit about the design process, um, what, what we've done as a NASA team, um, eventually some contractor, some large aerospace company is going to build the vehicle. NASA tries not to be in the business generally of building um, spacecraft, but the problem is it's hard to tell someone what to build if you haven't built it yourself, if you don't have one in front of you, right? It's the whole, give me a rock, or, or sorry, how does that go? Bring me, a rock. bring me a rock, and then you bring someone a rock and they go, I didn't want that rock. Uh, well, but you didn't tell me what kind of rock you wanted. Um, so it's, it's the idea that if we can design a point, if we can design a specific vehicle that we think can do the mission, um, it allows us to learn about those systems and to try and get an understanding of what it is that we actually do want to have built, what we actually do want to fly. And that enables us to better tell someone else, okay, here's the rock that we want specifically. So if you think about looking for a university, you might say that, okay, I want a university that has, um, I want it to be a good program, I want it to be in a big city, and I want it to have a good fitness center. And, and that's, those are your requirements. You show up at university on the first day, um, by big city, you meant, um, let's say by big city, you meant Sydney or Tokyo or New York, and you ended up in a big city that you've never heard of before because it was big compared to like parks, but not really big compared to Sydney. Um, and instead of, and they might have um, a bunch of uh, weights, you know, weight equipment, but they didn't have a pool, and what you really wanted was a pool. Um, so it's just the idea of, of trying to really understand what it is that you want so you can tell someone else what you want. Um, so that's. That's what have been our design process is we worked on a specific design, um, gotten smart about it, and um, that enables us to then move forward and um, go tell someone else how we actually want the vehicle to be built. Um, so the other thing about the design process is as an engineer, um, I'm not an astronaut yet, maybe, and I might never be. Um, I also have not flown in a spacecraft before. So um, it helps us, as Wayne was saying, to talk to the Apollo astronauts um, and to talk to Apollo engineers, one of which we actually have working on our team. Um, he's sort of the grand, we call him, I call him the grandfather, Wayne calls him the godfather, um, <laughs> that provides in, insight into the things that we're trying to do and the questions we're trying to answer. Um, so some of the neat opportunities that I've had as, as a young engineer um, at NASA uh, has been to, to meet the Apollo astronauts. And we have, um, and what we call, uh, Building 220 is this big warehouse at, at Johnson Space Center. And so in order to get a sense of the size of the vehicle we're trying to build, because Wayne has explained that it's really a cramped space that the, that the astronauts would be flying in, and part of that's just the nature of spacecraft and the fact that they're heavy to fly. Uh, so we have these mock-ups. These are PVC piping and, and, and plastic molded that they can kind of, um, it's basically a shell, and they have it set up so that you can adjust the walls to make it smaller or bigger depending on what size you're trying to test. So we had the uh, Apollo astronauts who sat in a room, asked some questions, we moved into where our mock-ups are, and they, they, they crawl in, and they, they get into our airlock that we have set up, and when they get into um, 
the asset module and they're looking out the little cutout windows and you know, we're trying to tell them, imagine you're on top of a two-story building and trying to land this thing. And it's just neat to, to interact with them and to be able to ask them questions as they react to what it is, you know, and they're in there going, oh yeah, this doesn't feel too bad and it feels kind of roomy compared to what we had, but of course they're not in space suits, they're in, you know, suits and um, so, so trying to, to lean from that. And, and actually, a, a story along with that that, that I have, I, I remember the, this was my first, um, I wasn't in the room at the time, it was over a video conference, but one of the questions, um, and it may have been Gene Cernan, was asked, you know, what was the one thing that we did wrong? You know, if you could change anything, what would it be? And he said, send them with hot water. He's like, they were only there three days, but apparently they didn't have hot water on Apollo. And the two things he wanted was a hot cup of coffee and a chance to shave. <laughs> and and, and I, we, the reason that's especially funny to me is that I've sat in a conference room with, the, with our engineers and we've been talking about um, our life support system which provides water and our thermal system which would heat the water and arguing about the uh, extra 10 or 15 kilograms that it would take to fly hot water as opposed to just you know, room temperature or moon temperature water coming out of a spigot. So um, it, it, it's, it sounds funny and it seems like, well, of course we would want hot water. I mean, I like my coffee in the morning or to be able to brush my teeth or you, you don't brush your teeth with hot water. Wash my face. Um, but, but, it, but from a design perspective, it, it makes a difference in the way that we design the vehicle. So um, it's been very interesting to do that. If you want to go to the next slide. The other thing that um, I've had a chance to do is uh, not being an astronaut. I can imagine what zero gravity feels like because you literally float, right? So you can imagine being able to go, if you have two vehicles that are docked and there's a tunnel connecting them and there's no gravity, you can imagine kind of like pulling your way through that and that's, that's easy because you're just floating around. But, but I don't have a clue what lunar gravity feels like. So I'm actually curious um, what, what you guys think lunar gravity would be like. What's, what's something that would be different than regular gravity? Just throw out ideas. It's weaker. It is weaker, so it's, it's one-sixth that of, of the Earth. So it's definitely weaker. So what does that mean in the way that you would move or, or conduct experiments? Slower. Sorry? You would move slower. You would move slower. Why slower? Because every, like, say if you take a step, you're going to go higher each time. So it's going to take you more time to get off the ground and get back on the ground? Yeah. Yeah? Any other ideas? <laughs> Sorry? Right, so it seems like it would be a lot easier, right? Because you, instead of weighing, I'm gonna guess I weigh around 70 or 80 kilograms. I'm not sure. No. <laughs> oh, it's like half. It's like I weigh about, let's say 50, 50 or 60 kilograms. I didn't do the math, I was just guessing. And 2.2 uh, to one, right. And, um, and so, so you imagine weighing that much less and then trying with the same muscle mass that you have, trying to move your weight around, right? So it, it, like you said, it's much, like things weigh a lot less so it's easier to move them. One of the things I didn't consider is um, the tunnel that, that we're having them go through currently between the asset module and the, and the, the airlock is a, is, a, is a, well, you can see it in the picture, um, sort of. So this is one potential uh, tunnel size that we would consider connecting the vehicle, not the vehicles, but connecting our asset module and airlock with. And um, this is an astronaut uh, that, that was doing the test with us. So we were actually in, a, in, a, um, in an airplane that was designed, um, or I guess configured, to do parabolic flights. So it could simulate Mars gravity, lunar gravity, zero gravity. So we were doing a lunar gravity test. And as an engineer, it was very interesting to, to, to be in that environment and to understand. Because if you look at that tunnel, can you imagine crawling through that in, in, in our Earth gravity in a suit? That's very burdensome. It would take a lot of energy. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, if you're 35, 30 or 35 years old or 40 years old, however the astronauts are that we send up, and, and they're having to bend over in the suit and, and, and kind of like, you know, it just it doesn't make sense to me in, in Earth gravity. I would never design that for someone. But you go and you fly this and you watch them as they, as they test. And we ran, um, we had the opportunity to do a hundred of these, about a hundred of these back and forth through the tunnels because of the, the number of parabolas that we did over two days. And, you, and I got to talk to the astronaut and understand what he was experiencing, which was part of the test, right? So some of it was how easy was it to move the hatch and put it back on, um, different step heights in and out of the tunnel, and then just how, and, and to witness that and to be, to be able to experience what lunar energy felt like, going through this tunnel is a piece of cake when you're in one six gravity because it's so easy to pop back up off the ground. It's easy to, it's just, it's a lot easier than I expected it to be. 
Um, so another really neat opportunity that was important as an engineer trying to design the next lunar lander that you, you, you don't necessarily get every day. So hopefully some of you, if you haven't already, might have a chance to do experiments or, or um, you know, also experience the parabolic flights and, and see that because it's, it's something I did actually, once I got out of school, I didn't think I was ever going to do and then I got to do it. So it was very cool. Um, okay, let's move on. I forget what's next. So in terms of um, the interfaces that, that we have as a vehicle, so Altair is a lunar lander. We obviously have to work with Orion, which is the crew vehicle. Um, we're also, as we talked about, trying to develop um, a, an outpost station uh, or scientific research station at the South Pole. So this is an artist's conception of what that might look like. Um, so some of the things that we have to consider being able to take, um, oh, I remember, the other thing I was going to tell you. Um, on the vehicle, there's really, there's really two types. I talked about the different missions, 7-day versus 210. Those would be the crewed missions. But we also have a lot of hardware, um, such as habitats and working facilities, laboratories, experiments. You need transport on the moon. So we not only need a way to move the astronauts around from place to place, but we also need a way to move the habitats and anything else we would fly down. So we, we have to have the capability to carry a lot of cargo to the surface. So the other version of our vehicle that we're designing, um, you basically would remove the ascent module and the airlock off of the top of it. You would load it down with cargo. So we can send about 14 and a half metric tons of cargo um, with today's design. And you would land that cargo and then have robots um, and the things that could be unloaded by the astronauts. You would have them basically get, unload that and set it up as part of the outpost. So that was the other piece. Um, so again, artist conception, but it kind of gives you an idea of this would be a node and a way to connect multiple um, facilities together. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, this is one of the, the concepts that we actually have hardware for. It's called the Lunar Electric Rover. Um, so this is something, again, that our surface systems colleagues are actually developing um, and designing. And the idea is that um, this would be a pressurized vehicle. So you could sit in the vehicle the way that we are here. So it's pressurized, meaning you don't have to wear a spacesuit. And you could travel up to 100 or 200 kilometers away to do research. If you saw something really interesting that you wanted to check out, you would basically, uh, the way it's currently designed is you can barely see it, but there's a suit that's connected to the back. It looks kind of funny. It, that's the suit port design, yeah? As opposed to the suit lock. Um, so the suit, it's, I guess you guys don't care what it's called, I understand. <laughs> so on the back, basically, of the vehicle are, are two vehicle, are two spacesuits that are attached. So you basically would crawl into the suit from the vehicle. You, ha you close the hatch behind you, and then you, you jump off the back of the car somehow. I don't know. But, um, but, but you'd see something interesting. You'd get in your suit. You'd go out and explore. You'd attach yourself back in, crawl back out. And so you could live in this, in this um, rover for um, maybe 7 to 14 days. Uh, and then another version of it would be just the chassis where you could be in your spacesuit. You jump on it like a, a moped, or um, we call it a chariot, and you could drive it around and just you know go there close to the base and move out. So um, some of the concepts that we're working on for surface systems. Go to the next. So what's neat about this is that um, it's real hardware that, that they've actually been building and testing. So depending on where you're at in the design process determines kind of how soon you want to check out um, conceptual um, designs that you have and ideas. And so surface systems, because a lot of these are very novel, because of the, the size of cargo that we're talking about, because of the, the systems, the new systems that are having to be designed and tested, um, they've, they've got a couple of concepts that they've actually been out testing. So I don't know if you can tell, but that's Wayne and I, actually. This is a Johnson Space Center again. And we, we got a chance to go in and, and, um, and explore or tour. And they've actually, they'll take this out um, to the desert to test it. And they've actually had VIPs. Well, the astronauts, they need someone to kind of test the hardware and see if it's going to break. Um, the astronauts enjoy doing that because they get to go out and, and you know, beat the heck out of it and, and see if they can bust a wheel or whatever. So, so they've actually taken it out tested it. And they have stories of, of VIPs being in the chariot and it taking off and them almost knocking over stands that they jumped into it with. And um, so it's, it's humorous. But also, I mean, they always try to be careful, too, because it's expensive to build these. So, um, so it's just neat to see that we, we've actually been designing hardware. We're actually testing it. Um, to try and, and understand how we're going to do this, what it's going to take to actually get us back to the moon. Last slide. So I think this is the last one that I was going to talk to, and it's basically a picture of the mountain in the Arizona desert. Um, testing. It's called the team is called RATS. Um, R A T S. I, for the life of me, can't remember what that stands for, but it's a fun name. 
and and they and they enjoy um, they, at weeks at a time they, they go out. And something I had forgotten that Wayne mentioned the other day is this: um, the as part of promotion with NASA and us going back to the moon, this actually drove in the um, the inauguration parade for President Obama. So. <laughs> So apparently that was kind of a highlight, and, and so the guys that got to take it out and drive it were excited, you know, and I'm sure everyone wanted to ride in it. So, so it's kind of exciting. Um, but just, I guess, I, and I just want to, I just want to share that um, that being able to work um, on the opportunity for us to go back to the moon has just, it's been, it's seemingly very unique um, for me. Right now, Altair is a very small team, and so as we get closer to um, to actually uh, designing. Uh, with the requirements, designing more, more detailed aspects of the vehicle and then building it, that team is going to grow immensely. Um, but there, as Wayne said, there are just a lot of opportunities. Um, if this is really what we decide to do um, over the next 10 to 20 years in, in human spaceflight, there's just a lot of really neat and exciting things to do and a lot of opportunity there um, to, to work on challenges, both from a, an engineering technology perspective and from a scientific perspective. Not only do you have the science on the moon, that we're going to be developing and working on um, experiments and uh, instruments for. But there's also the science of the people. Uh, so if you're interested in biomedical um, engineering or, or bi biology or physiology, there are a lot of things that, that we don't know that we're trying to learn on the moon um, that we would then need for, for long periods um, of, of space flight or for living somewhere else, such as Mars as well. And so there are a lot of different aspects about it and a lot of exciting things going on with it. Um, and I feel very lucky to, um, to be able to work on Altair and, and to get to share some of that with you guys. Um, I was actually shocked at the number of you who um, would like to go to the moon. And I don't know how many of those as, are as astronauts or as tourists. I frankly don't care. I think it's great that you want to go. And um, I'm excited about that. So um, I'll turn it back over to Wayne and let you wrap up. Okay, so we'll try to wrap this up here since I know I'm the man standing between you and lunch. <laughs> but if you indulge me for about five more minutes, have a little bit of philosophy for you. As you know, this week is the 40th anniversary of the first landing on the moon. And you've heard a lot about it in the news and the significance of what it meant to society. I'm going to tell you about another anniversary that occurred eight months prior that I personally think is much more significant. And it is the 40th anniversary of what we call the Big Blue Marble. Let me tell you a little bit about December 1968. It was really a time of turmoil within the United States and somewhat around the world. At the beginning of the 1968, the United States was mired in the Vietnam War. And there was hope that maybe the war would come to a rapid end. There were signs of peace talks beginning, beginning to arrive. And then in January, there was a Tet Offensive that <laughs> caught the soldiers in Vietnam by surprise, and it was really quite a shock to the country that it was just an indication that we were getting deeper into the war. Then in June, RFK, Robert Kennedy, campaigning for president, was assassinated. And then I think sometime also in there, Martin Luther King was also assassinated. That was April that year. It was really a tough, tough time all the young people in society were wondering, well, what is our place in the world? And what does life really mean? And are we going anywhere in the future? And then came Apollo 8. This was December 1968. We were in the middle of the race to the moon. And there was word that the Russians were going to try to send astronauts in their vehicles to circumnavigate the moon. This had NASA very, very worried because, well, quite frankly, John F. Kennedy did not want us to lose a race to the moon. At this time, we were not ready to go to the moon. Saturn V had flown twice, and it hadn't worked each, both times. It had not worked. It, it hadn't blown up, but it, it had wild oscillations in the upper stages that would have been dangerous for the astronauts to fly. The Saturn V had never flown what we call all up with astronauts. When we, go, when we were going to go to the moon for the first time and, and not land yet, they were going to bring the lunar, land, the lunar lander with them. Why? The lunar lander also has an engine. And that engine can, can light up to bring the, could have lit up to bring the Apollo astronauts home if the 
engine on the service module had failed. And in fact, on Apollo 13, that's what happened. They had to use the LEM, the propulsion of the LEM to come home. The LEM wasn't ready yet. The LEM would not be ready until May of 1969. So there they were faced with the decision of putting the Apollo 8 astronauts on top of a Saturn V that had never flown successfully before with no lunar lander to try to go circumnavigate the moon. They launched several days before Christmas. And I think most of you know the rest of history, of the history where on Christmas Eve, they orbited the moon for 10 times, reading out of the book of Genesis for the entire world to hear, and bringing us the big blue marble. Many historians will look back, and they will consider the race to the moon, one, not with Apollo 11, but from the perspective of momentum, one, with Apollo 11, in terms of the momentum needed to finish off the program. It would be three more dangerous flights before Neil Armstrong would set foot on the moon, but it was Apollo 8 that laid the groundwork for that to happen. Now, a lot of people wonder, I've been, ever since I got off the plane at uh, Sydney Airport last Thursday, I've gotten, my phone has felt like it's rung off the hook in terms of reporters calling to talk to us about what we're doing and going back to the moon, the significance of that, what do we think about the 40th anniversary? And a lot of co we get a lot of questions about, well, why are we doing this and how important is it to do this? And I wanted to share some of my thoughts with you in closing. There are those that ask, well, why is it, are we, why is it we're going to explore the moon? Haven't we been there already? Haven't we done that already? Well, let me share with you the thought that during the Apollo program, we only landed six times, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, only six times. First three missions, they were only there for a day at a time. Last couple missions, two and three days at a time. Moon is a very big place to explore. If I were to tell you that, okay, I'm from California, and I were to tell you that I'm going to visit Sydney or I'm going to visit Australia six times for one day at a time, and voila, I learned all there is to learn about Australia, I understand all there is to under experience about the culture, you'd laugh at me. But that's what we're proposing. Think about how ludicrous that is. We've only been to the moon six times, and there are people out there thinking, we've been there, we've done that. So we are not done exploring the moon yet. We have just barely begun to explore the moon. We have just barely begun to explore the universe. And we ask ourselves, just how important is that? Well, don't we have problems here on Earth to solve? Don't we have people in the streets that are hungry? Don't we have health care issues? We've got global climate change issues to deal with. All very, very important and all things that we must address. However, I will maintain for you that space exploration does not come at the expense of solving our current problems, nor should we wait for all the current problems to be solved before headed out into space. Consider 1492 and Christopher Columbus about to set sail for the New World. Well, guess what? 1492, things weren't much better. There were hungry people in 1492. Guess what? They had health care problems. They even had the plague. <laughs> <laughs> and they had pollution. They had crime. Governments weren't stable. And if you had asked Christopher Columbus to wait for all the problems of his time to be solved before setting sail for the new world, I guarantee you the wood used to build the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria would still be rotting in Portugal today. And if you had asked Christopher Columbus to make a list of all the tangible benefits of exploring the new world before setting out and before getting the queen to commit a large fortune to fund, this, fund his mission, I guarantee you Australia and the United States would not exist today. History has shown time and time and time again that societies that explore prosper. It is like basic research. You cannot quantify the benefits of basic research, but it has always been there. And it is the same thing with exploration. So, just look through history. Societies that do not explore flounder, and they ultimately die. And that is why we explore, because it is intrinsic in our nature and intrinsic to survival as a society. If we as a society do not continue to explore, and we don't explore the moon and onto Mars, I will guarantee you that we'll have truly accomplished a first in human history. 
we will be the first society to draw the line in the sand and say this far and no further. Think about what a horrible legacy that would be to leave to the people to come after us. And so in closing, if we could go to the final slide, I'm going to show you something. Gene Cernan can say it better than me. Let's play the video. Oh, okay. You just click in the middle screen. No, that goes to the next slide. Yeah, right here. <coughs> uh, let's go back one. Whoops. New problem. It's on slide. It's on slide 22. Here we go. Oh. So in closing, I wanted to say thank you for your time today. You've been a remarkable audience. And I also wanted to say thank you on behalf of NASA to the people of Australia. Space exploration would not be possible without the contributions from this great country and from everybody at NASA and the people of the United States. Thank you so much.